What's up, family? Uh, I guess my job is to introduce Nathan. Yeah. In the East Coast. In the East Coast, okay. Uh, I guess um, we went well, right before the end of the year over to um, New York, upstate New York, Manhattan, New Jersey, and we went over with uh, the whosoevers, and we got the opportunity to speak in front of all kinds of kids and just share our hearts with them, tell them how much God loves them, and just about God's grace. And, and in doing all that, our brother Nathan, who's going to share with you, he's the one who just caught the vision, and he just ran with it. Um, and he, you know, just started calling around. He actually called a Christian high school and said, hey, well, Sonny and Ryan are going to be in town. They'd love to just come and hang with your kids. And, and they said no. And then, uh, and then two secular high schools found out that we can go into schools and speak with their kids. So two secular high schools in his neighborhood said, well, have them come over and they could speak at the Bible club. And so we got a chance to go into the public high schools and actually share at the Bible Club. And all these kids showed up because they just didn't believe that we would actually come and want to hang out with them and love on them. So it was awesome. And, and, and Nathan is, op you know, he's finding out ways to keep doing that. So keep praying about that. But he's an awesome dude. I, I just met Nathan at um, the last men's conference. And he's just got a heart of gold. I, I don't even have to talk about his accomplishments. He's just He's amazing. I just went to his, his Kung Fu studio and watched him with the samurai sword and all this stuff, and I just stood back and was blown away. He's, because he's so humble and he's just so mellow, and you would never know that he can kill you with one little pinky. <laughs> but he's got an awesome heart of gold, so I want you guys to just listen to what he's got to say. He loves you guys, and so I'm going to invite Nathan Robinson to come out. Thank you, guys. Good evening. So it is uh, it's great to be here and uh, I'd like to welcome everybody to the gig. Uh, my name is Nathan Robinson. I'm a pastor in uh, Wappingers Falls, New York. And I gotta catch my breath. And uh, I've been asked to come tonight and uh, just share with you uh, my story. So uh, I grew up in the Bronx in New York City. And my mother uh, grew up as an Orthodox Jew. And she came from a family that survived World War II, the Holocaust. And as a young girl, she was bright, she was active, and academically, she was at the top of her class. When she was in elementary school, sometime in the late 1940s, early 1950s, she contracted a deadly disease called measles. And they didn't have a cure at that time. From measles, she went into encephalitis, which is a sleeping disease, and she went into a coma. During the time while she was, uh, she was in a coma for about three or four months, and she came out of that coma brain damaged. Uh, she did recover, and uh, 
Her recovery was very slow. During that time when she came out, uh, she had to be totally re-socialized. She had to learn how to read, write, walk, talk. And when she returned to school, she was delayed and struggled greatly. Many times she was made fun of by her peers, which had a detrimental effect on her. Toward the end of her teen years, uh, she became angry, she rebelled, and she began wandering away from the Jewish faith. She began to go out into the world, she began to party, she got into alcohol and drugs, and she would be going out, coming in at all hours of the night, and my grandparents had a real hard time dealing with the whole situation. And as a young Jewish girl, there are certain things that are forbidden. Number one is never have a child out of wedlock. Number two is never get married to a Gentile. They also have rule number three, which is never marry a jerk. So it kind of goes together. So, uh, but my mother landed up breaking all three of these, these laws. And uh, in her early 20s, uh, my mother ran away from home. Unknown to my grandparents, she was pregnant with me. And when she took off, uh, my grandparents had not heard from her for about eight months. During those eight months, my mother moved in with my father, and uh, she comes to find out that he's a chronic alcoholic. He's physically abusive. She gets battered regularly, and she is so mistreated that in the final weeks of her pregnancy, she finds herself out on the streets homeless, uh, broken, desperate, and at that point she called home to my grandparents. My grandparents answered the phone and asked her to please come home, no questions asked, and she returns home almost nine months pregnant, and they assist her, and several weeks later I am born. After I'm born, she returns home to my grandparents, and for a short time, uh, she stays there for about three or four weeks, and then she decides to go back with my father, and uh, she moves back in with him. My father was uh, quite an athlete. He was from Puerto Rico. And so when people ask what I am, they say, uh, what are you? So, you know, I'm half Puerto Rican, half Jewish, and in New York we call that a Jurican. <laughs> so, so that's what I am. But uh, anyways, my father was, uh, was a phenomenal baseball player. Um, he was in what you call, I guess, the minor professional leagues and he never made it because of his struggles with alcohol, violence, and drugs. The abuse in our home continues for three more years. At times the fighting is so severe that I remember as a young child, my mother would take me, she'd put me in the closet, lock the door, pass the key under the door, and then she would come back for me about an hour or so later. She'd open the door and she'd be absolutely battered. And finally, the relationship ends uh, about three or four years later, and I'm about four years old, and my mother is brutally uh, beaten. And uh, I remember she was hospitalized. My grandparents came to pick me up. When she got out of the hospital, we were standing out in front of the hospital, and I saw her. She was stitched up. She, unbelievable, her face was swollen. And I remember just staring at her and said, what happened? And uh, she said, Mommy fell. Mommy had an accident. And uh, I just remember these scenes of of being uh, in these situations. My grandmother uh, was working for the labor unions at the time. She had connections with the mafia, and she told my dad never to return, and if he did, he would never survive till the next morning, and we never saw him again. That was the last time I had seen him. My mother left that relationship mentally and physically battered, financially broke, and with my grandparents' help, she relocates with me to another apartment in the Bronx. And it's during the next five years that things get even worse. She now suffers from epilepsy, where she has these seizures. She collapses out. We could be out in a restaurant. We could be on a bus. We could be anywhere, and she just seizures out. And she struggles with drugs and alcohol. And in order to make ends meet, she, she begins begging for money. That doesn't work, so she gets into prostitution. So our home then became a place of, of prostitution. One day, we're on the subway, we're on our way to Brooklyn, and she seizures out in the middle of the subway. We wind up uh, on the platform, and police come, ambulances come, and they take her off to the hospital. I land up in social services, and uh, they just make a decision right then and there, and they say, you know what? You're no longer fit for society. 
And uh, she lands up getting institutionalized, and they called my grandparents, and they said, hey, uh, we have to make a decision as to what you want to do with your grandson. Either he's going to go into the system in the foster homes, or you can raise him. And thank God they made the decision at that point, and they took me in and they raised me. Um, my grandparents take me in, and they pretty much change my identity. And under my grandparents' care, I'm raised in a loving traditional home, and I'm raised as a full-blown Orthodox Jew. Uh, I attend temple three times a day. I observe all the Sabbaths and holy days. And for elementary school, I go to SAR Academy, which is a Hebrew school in the Bronx. And then I go to Yeshiva University High School, which is a rabbinical prep school. Uh, it's one of the leading schools in the nation, if you're going to be a rabbi. But I became a different type of rabbi. So, but, uh, but throughout my elementary and high school years, I struggled with learning disabilities, anger, confusion, and I was in special education classrooms. And when I was 13, I, my grandparents took me to Israel for three weeks. I was bar mitzvah there. Uh, I was bar mitzvah actually at the Wailing Wall and at the Great Knesset in Jerusalem at the Great Synagogue. While in junior high school, I began martial arts training in Krav Maga, which is an Israeli form of martial arts. And there was a lot of anti-Semitism going on at the time. So a lot of the kids would walk home from school. There'd be a lot of fights going on. At our high school, one of the kids got shot on the school bus in the morning on the Major Deegan Expressway. And so they brought in, and for our gym classes, it was really cool. We did martial arts. And you know what actually happened is nobody would mess with anybody because everybody knew martial arts. So, <laughs> so it, it raised a level of respect. So, uh, you know, everybody said, hey, I know Krav Maga, you know. And so there was this whole respect thing going on in the school. And uh, I really fell in love with martial arts. I continued after junior high school, got into kung fu, taekwondo, hapkido, weapons, and I began competing in tournaments throughout the country. In 1987, I graduated Yeshiva University High School. I was fluent in Hebrew with an honorary award and received a New York State uh, High School Diploma, a Regents Diploma. In 1988, I won the PKL NASCA AKL National Karate Championships at 18 years old. At that time, at 18 years old, um, life was pretty good for me. I had about $10,000 in the bank. I was driving a Lincoln Continental. I had a big blowout afro. <laughs> and uh, I had two national karate titles. And I began to think at that point, and I said, you know, what else is there to life? I feel like I've accomplished everything I've ever wanted to do in life at a young age, and, and what more was there. And um, I remember walking home one night. It was after training. It was winter. All the stars were out. I remember looking up at the sky and seeing everything, and then I just began to think about God. And I felt just an emptiness in my life. And I began to wonder, why am I here? Why was my childhood all screwed up? And what happens when life ends? And I didn't have the answers to those questions. And after studying the Old Testament for so many years, I didn't have any assurance in my life, and I was struggling greatly to keep the law. I was trying to be a good person, but, you know, the, the Jewish law was basically based on work. So I tried working hard to be a good person, but I'd fail almost immediately afterwards. It was a great struggle. And what was happening is my belief in God was fading quickly. That night I asked God, I says, if you're real, please reveal yourself to me. And it would not be long after that prayer that God would reveal himself to me in a very powerful and meaningful way, a way which transformed me into the person that I am today. In the summer of 1988, I picked up a part-time job at the YMCA, the Young Men's Christian Association, a nice Jewish boy in the YMCA. And uh, the strange thing was, is my grandmother found the job for me. And uh, she would later seriously regret that. But, <laughs> but uh, I took the job there. I got hired, called up, and had a job. And while I was lifeguarding, there was a Christian school that would come two days a week, and they would swim at the pool. And one of the teachers, his name was Danny, would come and share the gospel with me. And I would tell him, you know, I don't believe in Jesus. I don't need Jesus. Don't talk to me about Jesus. But I thought he was a really nice guy. So I would kind of entertain him for a little bit and then shut him down. And uh, one day he came in and he says, you know, I'm going to stop with the Jesus thing. And uh, he says, you know what, I got this really cool martial arts film. He says, why don't you come over for, for dinner and a movie? And I says, hey, I'm up for that. So 
I went over to, uh, to his house, and he puts this VCR tape in, and uh, it comes out, and it says, Fury to Freedom. And uh, so I'm watching this film, and, you know, and the story's about Raul Reese, Pastor Raul. And uh, I see this guy, a rebellious young man, who grows up in an abusive home. He gets into martial arts. He becomes a master. He joins the Marines. He fights in Vietnam. And when he returns, he gets married and becomes totally violent, kind of loses his mind. And at the end of the movie, he's home by himself with a rifle in his hands, waiting to kill his wife and his kids. And while he's waiting for them, he turns on the TV, and there's this preacher named Chuck Smith who's sharing the gospel. And it's at that moment that Raul receives Christ and is a changed man. And that evening, as I was thinking about my own life, as I was watching his life, I was like watching my own life, and I'd never seen anything like it. And I said to myself, you know, I says, whatever has changed his life, whatever that is, I need that to change my life. And as I drove home, <laughs> as I drove home that night, I asked God right in my car, please come into my heart. If Jesus is really the way, the truth, and the life, then come into my heart and fill my life. And at that moment, I felt God just come into me. There was a warmth, and uh, I was connected with the Lord at that point. Um, shortly after I accepted uh, Jesus Christ, I found out that Pastor Raul was on the radio, and I began listening to the radio program daily. It was a program called Manna for Today. And uh, one of the things that happened is I was excited about my commitment to Christ, but I didn't know how I was going to explain that to my grandparents. And I didn't know if they were going to share the same excitement. So I decided that I would become what's called an undercover Christian. So... <laughs> I became an undercover Christian. While I was home, I was a nice Jewish boy. And on Sunday mornings, I'd be sneaking out and going to, to church. And eventually, the Lord blew my cover. And my grandmother one day was cleaning out my room, and uh, she found some New Testaments and Christian literature, and she took it out, and she uh, freaked out. I came home that night, and I remember just walking down the corridor to my room, and there she was. She was standing with her arms crossed on top of my Bible and my other books. And, uh, and I came in, and, and I knew immediately what was going to happen. And uh, she looked at me, and she said to me, she says, uh, I have to give you the ultimatum. She confronted me. She says, have you accepted this Jesus? And I said, yes, I had. She says, have you been baptized? And I says, yes, I was. And she said, if you keep your Jesus, she goes, you'll lose everything, your car, your home, your money, your family. But if you deny him and go and see a rabbi, she goes, I'll let you keep everything, and I'll give you even more. And I told her, I said, at this point, I says, I would not trade the peace in my heart for all the money in the world, and I left. I packed my stuff and left. <laughs> that evening, I uh, called that guy Danny, <laughs> and uh, I showed up with my suitcase. And uh, I says, you got me into this mess, so you got to take care of me now. So uh, I live with, uh, with him and also another local Christian family. I got a job at a local supermarket in the deli department. And several months into that job, um, I began to become anxious because I wanted to do something with my life for God, but I didn't know what. And sometimes in life, we're in a situation and, and we say to ourselves, you know, why am I in this position? And... Uh, I was irritable already, so, uh, and as you know, if, if you're in retail or if you work in a supermarket, there's some days where you get certain customers that come and can really uh, up that. So I was working in the deli, and uh, this annoying lady came, and uh, I think Satan sent her, whatever, so, but uh, she shows up, and uh, she says, I want that chicken in the case, so I took the chicken out, and she says, put that one back, and I want that one, and so I switched them, and it's about the fourth chicken already, and she was asking for, like, the same chicken twice, and uh, so I finally, it was like the fifth chicken, and, uh, she, and I says, you want that chicken? She says, yeah, and I took that chicken, and I shoved it right over the counter at her, and uh, it hit her right in the chest, it bounced on the floor, and she looked at me, she started screaming and running around the store, and... Uh, she runs down to the manager, and I says, great. I said, now I'm going to get fired. And uh, the manager comes, and he says, what, you know, what's going on here? And I said, she wanted all these diff different chickens, so I gave this one to her, you know? So 
he, uh, he just says, you know what, just go take a walk. You know, let me just deal with this situation. And um, he was a nice guy, didn't get fired. And I was walking through the aisles and I was complaining to God. I accepted, you know, you and I've lost everything. And I'm working in this deli, wearing this stupid hat, dealing with this annoying people. And I said, what is this, you know, what's the point of following you? And, uh, and the Lord said to me, I, was, I remember where I was, I was in the, in the cereal aisle and Tony the Tiger was smiling at me. And, <laughs> and uh, I just said to the Lord at that point, I said, you know, I, says, I don't know if I can handle this. And God said to me, he says, do you want to serve me? And I said, yes. And he says, if you can't serve me here, how are you going to serve me in the ministry? And at that moment, I realized I was exactly where I needed to be. I was in the will of God in that very place. And I put that hat back on. I put a smile on. And I went back and I said, you know what, Lord, if this is where I'm to be for the rest of my life, I'm going to give it 100%. And I went back changed into that job. Shortly after, I began to feel a desire to go to California and learn the Word of God. I was listening to Pastor Rawl, loved the teaching, and uh, I began calling Pastor Dale, and I said, I want to come out there. But I says, I don't have the money to get out there. And he said to me, where God guides, God provides. And I said, well, what does that mean? So, so I said, is God going to send me a check or something? Or like, what's going to happen? He says, where God guides, God provides. And he says, if God wants you out here, you'll be out here. So, uh, at that point, I began to pray, and I didn't know there was such thing as an uh, income tax check that came back. I was 19 years old, so filed my taxes, and, and sure enough, I got a nice big check back, and I says, wow, where God guides, God provides. And so uh, I bought a car, a Chevy Cavalier that had 180,000 miles on it. I didn't know anything about cars. And uh, I packed that car, and I remember I brought it back to the dealer, and I said, there's oil coming out of the hood. He says, don't worry, just pour more in. It'll be fine. <laughs> so that's what I did. And uh, I loaded up my car. I called Pastor Dale, and I says, God has provided, and I'll be out there in, in a few days. And I packed my car. I drove cross country. Landed up at Calvary Chapel, West Covina, with oil pouring out of my hood. And uh, I met Pastor Dale and Pastor Rawl. And uh, they put me up in the, they had a missionary camper and there was a young man there named Aaron Gonzalez, and they called him Crazy Aaron. And I didn't know why, but I found out why it later. So, but, uh, so me and Aaron were living in this camper in the back of the church. We were washing our hair in the sinks, and it was, it was just great. And uh, we were there learning the Word of God. And within a few weeks, the Lord had moved me into a beautiful home that I was able to watch for the church. And uh, God really began to work in my life. I was here almost every night. I got a job in a uh, supermarket God had provided and was just studying the Word of God. After several months, the Lord opened the doors for me to come on staff, and uh, I was here just doing whatever needed to be done, cleaning, uh, driving, whatever it was that God had. I was just here to serve, and I began to learn what ministry was about. My friend Aaron, uh, who was also on staff, began ministering at Baldwin Park High School, and one day he asked me to go with him, and he was leading a lunchtime Bible study. And at the end of one of his studies, he put me on the spot, and he said, this is my friend Nathan, and he's going to share his testimony with you today. And I said, what the heck is a testimony? <laughs> he said, just tell him your story. Just tell him your story. So I was nervous and shaking and talking to these kids, and they were just kind of staring at me, and I'm like, I can't believe this. But uh, afterwards, the kids came up, and they said, hey, you know what? Thanks for telling us your story. And uh, as I left there that day, I knew in my heart that God wanted me to share his word in some capacity. And uh, I began to study even more and uh, was looking forward to whatever God was going to do. During that time at Calvary Chapel, West Covina, Grandma decided to come and visit me. She was convinced that I was in a cult. We were in a cult. <laughs> and so she comes and she meets with Pastor Rawl and Pastor Dale, and she says, you have brainwashed my son. And she says, I know if I write you a check that I can walk out of here with him. And she pulled out her checkbook in front of Pastor Rawl, and she says, what is the amount? And Pastor Rawl said, $2 million. <laughs> so so uh, he just says, no, you can take him. You can take him. And uh, and she just couldn't believe it. So uh, she says, he's free to go. We're not keeping him here. He, he's come by his free will. He, he leaves by his free will. So she left. She came back a day or two later. And she said to me, she goes, I will let you stay here under one condition. 
She says, I've hired the head rabbi of Los Angeles, and I want you to go and meet with him for two or three days. And after that meeting, if you decide to stay here, she says, I will let you stay here. So uh, I asked Pastor Rawl and Pastor Dale, and said, sure, go, go and talk to him. Share the Lord with him. And uh, <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> so there I was in downtown L.A. in the kosher pizza shop. And I'm sitting there with the head rabbi of Los Angeles. And he says to me, would you like to pray? And now everybody in there is, is ultra-Orthodox. And I said, certainly. And I prayed. And when I said, in Jesus' name, everyone went, ah! you know, in the restaurant. And that's how our meeting began. And we met for uh, two days. And at the end of two days, we just went back and forth on the scriptures. And he brings me back out to my grandmother. I asked him actually at the end of that meeting, I said, if you know all of the New Testament, the Old Testament, and you see clearly that Christ is the Messiah, why haven't you accepted him? And at that point, he slammed his Bible down, and he said, our meeting is over. And he brought me back out to my grandmother, and she had a big smile on her face, and so she said, is he back to normal? And the rabbi said, there's nothing wrong with him. She says, he has a sincere faith in God. I wish some of our own people had this faith that he has. We just disagree on who the Messiah is. She goes, so you mean he's not coming back? And he says, I don't think so. So she says, give me my check back. <laughs> he wasn't going to give, so they started fighting right there in the office. And I said, Grandma, we better get out of here. So, uh, so we left, and uh, she eventually went back to New York, and uh, I landed up staying. After nearly two years here in California, I returned to the East Coast to start a church. Um, the church did well, and uh, was in Westchester County, New York. There I met my wife, Grace, and less than a year into our relationship, we had decided that we wanted to get married, and we ran into a little opposition and some obstacles. And in, instead of obeying the Word of God, we fell into sin, and she got pregnant. And I landed up stepping down from the church and leaving the ministry altogether. I took what happened very badly. I was disappointed in myself, and I disappeared into the world, and my disappearance from the church was about 13 years. After stepping down from the ministry, Grace and I got married. Immediately, we went to the courthouse. We've been married now 16 years. We have two boys. And uh, after I left the ministry, I went to selling vacuum cleaners door to door. That was a lot of fun. And uh, I was driving a delivery truck. I was worked in a bank. And then ultimately, I went back into the martial arts. I had opened up a school. And during that time, the Lord had blessed what I was doing. And uh, I had won three world titles. I became the head coach of the U.S. Army team at West Point, their martial arts team. And even though I had walked away from God's plan for my life, God did not walk away from me. In February of 2005, I was in Las Vegas at a tournament and had been in uh, I had to be in L.A. that Monday, and I decided to stop by Calvary Chapel Golden Springs on Sunday morning for the first time in 13 years. I came in, and I attended service, and it was great, and uh, I was looking for Pastor Dale, and when I left, he had a full head of hair, so when I came back, he was bald, and so I, I was looking, I said, is that Pastor Dale? And sure enough, it was him. And uh, I went up to him, and he was just, you know, stunned, just staring at me. We stared, we embraced, and uh, he brought me to Pastor Rawl. In a meeting with Pastor Dale, he sat me down, and he told me that the call of God was irrevocable upon my life. He said to me, Nathan, God, we were sitting right there in the fellowship hall. He says, God is going to call you back shortly. I don't know how, but I know he's going to call you back. And when he calls you, I want you to call me. And uh, I said, I don't, I don't want to be in ministry. Yeah, I just can't do this anymore. And I said, but if God calls me, I'll call you. Don't worry. And uh, they loaded me up with books, and I left. Two months later, April 2005, while preparing for a martial arts demonstration in West Point for the Army team, I was coming down from about four and a half feet in the air, landed in between two mats. My knee locked. I blew out my knee landing from that jump. My knee came out of joint completely and then snapped back in. It swelled badly. And uh, Monday I went to my doctor who said it was bad and I needed to see a surgeon. And he recommended a well-known sports surgeon named Russell Tiggis who worked on professional athletes. And I called his office that afternoon. I said, hey, this is who I am. I need an appointment. 
And uh, his secretary said, it's three months for the next appointment. I says, you don't understand who I am. This is what I do for a living. I need to see you. And they were like, I'm sorry. If you were the president, it's three months. So uh, I was at, you know, at that point, I felt like I was out of luck. And uh, I made some other calls and got an appointment for another doctor on Thursday. Tuesday night, I go into my school. I'm hobbling around. And one of my parents comes up to me, and she is a Christian. She doesn't know anything about me. She doesn't know I've been to the doctor. And she says, Mr. Robinson, she says, uh, I have a knee injury. And I heard you hurt your knee. I says, I did. And uh, she says, I've been waiting three months to see this great doctor in the area, and I want to make sure you see the right doctor. And God has told me to give me, to give you this appointment. And she hands me the card, and it says, Russell Tigges. I was speechless. I tried to give it back to her, and she walked away. The next morning, I saw that doctor. He looked at my knee, and he says, you have one of the worst knee injuries an athlete could have. He goes, you've tore your ACL cartilage. You need a full-blown reconstruction. And uh, he says, you'll be out for a year, full recovery, maybe 18 months to two years. And uh, I ended up getting the surgery in July of 2005. After surgery, I was laid out for months. I, went from a, I had to learn how to walk again. I went from a wheelchair to crutches to a cane to learning literally in physical therapy to walk again. During that time on my back, unable to work, I fell into despair, and I began reading the Bible. And one night while reading about Jacob wrestling with the angel of the Lord, God told me he took my knee out of joint, and now I would be serving him. And I said, Lord, I can't serve you. And I continued reading through the word of God. When I got up to the life of Moses at the burning bush, God began calling me back again. And I related to Moses as Moses was content being in the desert, isolated from the church and from the world. In November of 2005, God lifted this burden that I had been carrying for all these years. As I was reading about all the men of Scripture, Moses, Abraham, Jacob, David, the Lord said to me, he says, do you see they've had successes and they've had failures? And I said, yes, Lord, I see that. And the Lord said to me, he says, are you greater than all of these men? And I said, no, Lord. He says, if they have received my forgiveness and I've used their lives, who are you not to receive my forgiveness? At that moment, I humbled myself and God lifted that burden right then and there. It was 2 o'clock in the morning. My wife was out. And she comes home at 2 a.m. It's 13 years later. And uh, I say to her, I said, Honey, God has called me back into the ministry. And she says, Have you been taking that pain medication again? <laughs> and I said, No. I said, The Lord's called me back into the ministry. And she was just staring at me. And she says, We'll talk about it in the morning. The morning came, and I'm up calling my friends, my staff. You have to come over to my house. I have something to share with you. I have to tell you guys something. And two weeks later, we have 50 people sitting in our living room. And I shared my story for the first time. I got to the end and practically in tears, and I says, is there anybody here in this room who would like to receive Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior? And hands went up all over the room. I led at that point them in prayer to receive Christ as their Savior. And they says, we want to continue to meet and we moved from our home into the karate school. And we were there for eight months. And the study continued to grow and grow. And we eventually moved in uh, within that year into a building, to a, a brand new facility that God had provided. And uh, the church is now three years old. And we just actually last week rented more space in that building. And uh, we've expanded again our youth program. And we have a new radio program called The Spoken Word. And the highlight of 2009 for our ministry was clearly hosting the first East Coast Whosoever's Tour with Sonny Ryan, Head, and Melanie. And I believe that that will be the beginning of a great national work with our youth today. So we do. God is going to use that ministry powerfully to reach a generation that is clearly being lost today. It is different, but it speaks to the heart of where our kids are at today. It goes right into the depths. 
and it understands where kids are at, and it ministers life to them. It speaks their language completely. As I close, um, I want you to know that I have a tremendous heart for the young people today. I love people, families, young people, old people, Jewish people, Muslim people, all people. I love them all. And no matter what you've been through in your life or are going through, that God has a plan and a purpose for your life. God is concerned about you. He's concerned about your tears, your thoughts, your troubles, your hardships, your challenges. And no one wants to see you succeed in life more than the Lord. A verse that has great meaning to me, if you have a Bible, I'm just going to share this verse with you. It's Philippians chapter 3, verse 13. I leave you with this and one other verse this evening. It's a verse that God had given to me once I had come back to the Lord. And it says, Brethren, I do not count myself, Paul the Apostle writes this in Philippians, I do not count myself to have apprehended, but one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forward to those things which are ahead. I press toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Paul tells us here, he says, you know what? I do not count myself to have apprehended. For all of us here, God has a clear plan for our lives. And you know what? We're, we're not complete until we're before the throne room of God. That's when it is mission accomplished. But right now, while we're here, we have a divine purpose. No matter how old you are, no matter how young you are, you have a divine purpose, a, a divine calling upon your life. And Paul says, you know what? Don't think that you've apprehended. But one thing I do, he says, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forward to those things which are ahead. In order for us to move forward with the Lord, Paul says we need to forget those things that stop us and stumble us from the plan of God for our lives. And there are things in my life that were stumbling me and keeping me. And I'm sure if we all examine our hearts before God, there are things right now in our lives, the world, sin, that wants to keep us from the plan of God in our lives. And for everybody here, it can be something different. For everybody here, it can be something different. But we need to know what those things are, and we need to forget those things, and as Paul says, reach forward to those things which are ahead. Paul says, I press toward the goal for the prize. You know what that means? If you were in a marathon and you were running, and you were coming towards the finish line, it would mean literally throwing your body forward with effort, pressing forward, pressure, moving forward across that line, pressing towards what God has for you in your life. All our energy, all of our life, all of our heart just laid out for God. And you want to know something? When you do that in your life, you will be a champion for God. Because God will take you and he'll take a fool like me and a fool like you and he'll say, hey, you know what? If you surrender, if you serve, if you humble, if you lay your life down, I'll take your life and I'll use it. As wretched, as miserable as you are. I have one little story to tell you. One of the things that, after I got saved, I had a hard time with, all the way up until I returned to the Lord, was the word forgiveness and grace. I hated my mother. I blamed her for all the misery, all the pain, all the things I saw as a young person, the drugs, the alcohol, the prostitution, the abuse, the seizures, the nightmares, the crying, the pain, having to visit her in an institution. I blamed her. I hated her. Couldn't even visit her, talk to her. And while I was in Calvary Chapel, West Covina, uh, before I left, a lot of teens were coming in, and this one particular girl came in, and she was an absolute wreck. Uh, a very similar story to my mother, and she came in, and we were ministering to her, and praying with her, and had compassion upon her, and right there while she was before me, the Lord said to me, he says, do you have compassion for this young lady? And I said, yes, Lord. And he says, this young girl was just like your mother, and if you can have compassion on her, why can't you have compassion on your mother? She's no different. And all of a sudden, I saw my mother as a young teenager who made bad decisions, who needed to be loved and guided and prayed for. At that point, I had called and 
forgiven my mother, and God had healed that relationship. And that relationship has come a long ways today. We have to be able in our lives, forgiveness and love is a two-way street. We have to be able to receive forgiveness and love, and we need to be able to give forgiveness and love. Don't let that be a stumbling block in your life. Matthew eleven twenty eight through 30 says, Come unto me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Let's pray. Father, we come before you. We just thank you, Lord, for your grace, for your love, for your forgiveness, for your mercy upon our lives. We thank you for your faithfulness. We thank you that you're patient. Lord, we thank you that you desire a relationship with us, that you desire to see us in heaven, to be with you, to explore and see the riches, and the fullness, the depths that you have prepared for us. And Lord, we know, I know, that there's no one who desires more to see us succeed here and in the time to come than you. And Lord, we pray this evening, Lord, that our hearts would be yielded, would be fully submitted before you, that you may do a great work in our lives. With every head bowed and nobody looking around, if you're here tonight, you have heard this message, and God has spoken to your heart, and maybe you're at a time where I was where I said, you know what, whatever that guy has is what I need in my life. And you don't know Jesus Christ. Or you're a person who has not really fully committed your life to the Lord. And tonight you would like to. Right now from wherever you're seated, I just want you to raise your hand if that's you this evening. Is there anyone here? God bless you. Anyone else here? God bless you. God bless you. Anyone else? who's here tonight, you want to make that full commitment to Jesus Christ in your life. Anyone else, just pass up your hands. God bless you. God bless you. What I'd like to do with you right now is I'm going to ask you to take a step of faith. For those of you that have raised your hands, I'd like you to stand up and I'd like you to come here to the front. I'd like to pray with you to receive Christ and to pray for God's Spirit to do a great work in your life. As they play, if you've raised your hand, please come on up to the front. Savior, I come, quiet my soul. Remember, redemption till where your blood was spilled. we close this building is a unique place I feel there's more of you here especially young people that are here the world is a rough rough place and God wants to use this time right now to open eternity to you to see you in heaven to give you a calling and a place this is a place almost like Superman where, where you come into this building and it's like the phone booth. And you can leave here tonight filled with God's Spirit, with literally, the, yes, the Holy Spirit in your life. And leave here a changed person with a new future and with a new hope. 
Don't let the enemy and don't let the world rip you off. As they play, I'm going to ask them to continue just for another moment. And if that's you, please come forward. Because God wants to save you. He wants to give you a plan and a purpose. you guys to move in closer together. I want to pray for you guys. Just repeat after me. Dear Jesus, I confess to you that I am a sinner. Please forgive me for all of my sins. I submit my life to you. to you. Please fill me with your Holy Spirit that my life may be changed, that I may have a future and a hope, that I may fulfill your purpose, that I may come across the line hearing those words, well done, thou good and faithful servant. Empower me, Lord. Help me to forget those things which are behind. May my ears, my eyes, my heart see this world differently as I leave here tonight. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you guys. I'm going to ask you guys to go that way. We're going to give you a Bible and some literature. If you could just head that way. God bless you guys. I love you guys. I just want to say thank you for having me. And look forward to seeing you again. And uh, if you get bored of the West Coast, come out to the East Coast to a Whosoever's tour. God bless you guys. Why don't we all stand? I'm going to share with you one more song. It's called Streetlight. And uh, again, it involves clapping and singing, so actually I'm going to teach you the part, okay? Am I, can you hear me, Joel? I mean, can you hear me? I mean, hey, what? You guys feel like singing? <laughs> you guys aren't very enthusiastic, but that's okay. Here we go. It goes like this. that? I'm trusting you guys. We better go like this.
change the world Am I looking for means to pave the way For brighter days Cause your love has changed The way it used to be Cause it used to be I couldn't see five feet in front of me Fighting to breathe under heavy seas I've been complete since I had dreams Till you finally took me over God bless you. We got some stuff in the back. We got some CDs and some posters and some not such cool t-shirts, but we'll be back there. I'd love to meet all you guys. God bless you.